Good afternoon. It is about 4.40 on the 5th of July. I'm going to talk about two topics today. One is Manifest Destiny and the other one is Life in the Antebellum South. I'll try to keep it pretty short and compact. It's a lot of information, but you can read the slides in front of you, so that should make this a little easier. I want to just talk a moment about the growth of the South. Um, by the 1830s, there are people moving into Alabama, Mississippi, Texas. Um, 1840s, Louisiana and Texas are both going to be part of the country. And a lot of these people who are moving west are going to be small independent farmers. The word that you're going to need to know is yeoman. Yeoman farmers are small independent farmers. And these people are being forced west primarily because there's no space along the East Coast anymore. And these farmers are going to try and find places that look similar to where they left. So if they used to live where there was a hill and a stream and some woods, they're going to try to find somewhere in Mississippi or Alabama or Arkansas even that has a small hill, a stream, and some woods. 1793, Eli Whitney invents the cotton gin. And this is important because it allows a machine to separate the cotton fibers from the cotton seeds. Now, the reason this is so important is it changes the type of cotton that can be grown in the South. Before the cotton gin, you had what was known as long staple cotton which meant that there was a long growing season and most of the seeds blossomed into uh, the cotton fibers. But by making it easier to remove the seeds, you could harvest cotton earlier and quicker and you had a machine that would take the seeds out for you, meaning that there's not as much hard labor as far as picking the seeds out of the cotton. With a shorter growing season required because of the cotton gin, cotton can move inland and cotton can move further north. And wherever cotton went, slavery was sure to follow because slave labor is what fuels the cotton farming of the South. Now, where is this cotton going? Somewhere between 70 and 80% of all cotton grown in the South goes across the Atlantic Ocean to England the remaining percentage is going to go to New England up to places like Boston where they have that brand new textile manufacturing system set up. Social relations in the South, they're not quite like what you see in the movies. Yes, planters are at top. A planter is generically defined as somebody who owns 20 or more slaves. Um, they are not always rich. They don't always have a ton of money to throw around. In fact, these planters are very often in debt because they're always trying to figure out how to buy more land or how to afford uh, more slaves, and there's a lot of buying and selling. Also, planters, even though they are at the top of society, they only make up about 5% of the population. Below these wealthy planters are small slaveholders. Small slaveholders is defined as having fewer than 20 slaves and more than one. Very often, a small slaveholder is going to own the second best land. They're going to have the second best of everything with the planters having the, the best of it all. When you look at percentage of population, about 20% or so are going to be the small slaveholders. Below the small slaveholders, you have the yeoman farmer. There's that word again. Remember, yeoman means independent. They are by far the most of the population, about 60%. They don't have any slaves. They may be able to afford to rent a slave here and there, but they don't have any slaves of their own. They do, however, own their own farms, 
and their farms can be as large as 200 acres. At the very bottom of white society in the south, you have the poor whites. They are about 10% of the population. They don't own any land. They don't own any property. They're usually going to be laborers that work for other people, whether it's the independent yeoman farmers, the small slaveholders, or maybe even the planters. Planters do control society, as it says here on this slide. Um, the planters have the most political power. The planters have the most economic power. The small slaveholders, they aspire to grow up and be planters. The independent yeoman farmers, they might get help from the planters. And the poor whites are going to be doing work for the planters. Now, whether you are a small slaveholder, a poor white, a rich planter, doesn't matter. You see your job in the Southern society as to keep control over African Americans. There was this belief at the time that African Americans um, were an inferior race and the idea of having slaves meant that all whites were equal because there was somebody underneath them that they could uh, subjugate. There are also pro-slavery arguments that circulate in the South. For example, uh, the pros of slavery are seen as it's in history. You find slavery in history. Those who are pro-slavery are going to say, look at ancient Rome, look at ancient Greece, look at the Old Testament. Uh, slavery is both historical and slavery is present in Christianity slash um, religion. There are going to be some people who say that slaves are treated better than wage workers in the North because the slaves have everything given to them. And yes, Southern churches, Southern preachers are going to preach the positives of slavery, at least the positives that they see, all the way up unto the Civil War. Now, of course, there's a lot of mental gymnastics that went into this, but in many cases, this, this pro-slavery Mindset is what you found throughout the South, whether you were a slave owner or not. Now, what was slave society like? Um, first of all, just a little disclaimer that I have here. There's no one easy explanation for what it was like to be a slave because there were many, many different opinions. There were many, many different points of view. There were many, many different experiences. A lot of the treatment of slaves depended on who they were owned by and how that master or owner treated them, what type of work they did or didn't do, whether they lived in a city, in a rural area, deep south, upper south. Um, slavery is just, it's complicated. That's easiest way to explain this. So what I have here are kind of some general information. Um, food is very basic. It's not much beyond a little bit of pork, uh, some cornmeal, some molasses to act as a sweetener. Uh, you could grow some vegetables on your own and if you were very very trusted then you might be allowed to hunt. Clothing, one to two cotton shirts or one to two dresses, uh, some very rough pants, no shoes until it's cold, and a straw hat to keep you um, shaded when you're working out in the sun. Your house, um, wooden floors, wooden logs, doors with holes in them, windows without glass, just wooden shutters, straw beds, chimney in the middle, and the house itself, about the size of an average bedroom today, if not smaller. There's disease everywhere. The diets are poor. You got no shoes on. The housing's crowded. Diseases spread fast. Infections are very often bad. Two types of work labor systems that you should know. One is gang labor. The other is task labor. 
Gang labor, think of everybody working together in a gang. That's where men and women both work in the fields at the same time. Uh, gang labor is very often used in cotton farming and tobacco farming. On the other end of the spectrum, you have task labor, where everybody does an individualized task. Uh, men and women are working separately, and that's going to be primarily sugar plantations down in Louisiana, rice plantations along the South Carolina and Georgia coast. So gang labor, task labor, two different styles of work. Probably don't need a slide for this, but I have it here anyways. You work sun up to sun down. The type of work and the difficulty of the work depend on the season. Even in the winter, you're still doing some sort of work. You're still preparing seeds to be planted in the spring and you're still fixing equipment and material and tools to get ready for that planting season. Some slaves are going to work as artisans. Some slaves are going to work as household servants. Um, that's both good and bad. It's good because you escape the heat of the, um, the field work, but it's bad because you're in much, much closer contact with the family that owns you. Um, generally speaking, house slaves are better off than field workers, but much of that is subjective and depends on individual circumstance. Slaves in cities have a much higher movement or freedom of movement, I should say. Um, very often, city slaves are going to do errands, work in factories, work in some sort of skilled fields like copper smithing, tin smithing, blacksmithing. Um, they might work in mines or lumber yards, shipyards. Um, and slaves who have some sort of learned skill like carpentry or blacksmithing, they're the ones who are sold and bought for the most money. Now controlling slaves, uh, really when you look at it, the physical conditions, the day-to-day -day life of a slave and a poor white, very similar. But the poor white has their freedom where, of course, the slaves don't. And if it's not the physical conditions of slavery that are so bad, what is it then? It's the mental conditioning, the fact that you, you are completely controlled by somebody who, who owns you. In 1830, there's a court case that goes to the Supreme Court in North Carolina. There was this guy named John Mann who whips a slave named Lydia uh, instead of submitting to the slipping or the uh, the whipping, Lydia slips off and runs away. And when she tries to run away from her master, uh, John Mann shoots her. John Mann is arrested for this. A lower court finds him guilty of I think it was assault and battery, but he appeals it to the high court in North Carolina. And it is the High Court of North Carolina in the court case State versus Man that ruled that slave owners have absolute authority over their slaves. They can't be guilty of anything they do against their slave. The Supreme Court of North Carolina says slaves are the absolute property of their owners. And the Chief Justice of North Carolina says the power of the master must be absolute to render the submission of the slave perfect. So from that point on, a slave owner can do whatever they want to a slave without anybody questioning it. So that gives us the mental, the mental um, suffering. The, the movements of the slaves completely controlled. Patrols to find you if you've run away or if you're missing. You have to submit to every single demand of the master, whether it is kind, mean, evil, doesn't matter. You have to do what the master says. 
Now, some masters were viewed as good because they treated their slaves like expensive property. Some slave owners were viewed as bad because they treated their slaves like property that was replaceable. There are some resistance movements. There's individualized resistance where slaves will stop working or work slower or run away. In some cases, the slaves will do uh, arson, murder, theft. But then there are some attempts to organize as well. And I have three of them listed here. The Prosser's Rebellion of Richmond, Virginia. The Vasey Rebellion of Charleston, South Carolina. And the Nat Turner's Rebellion that you should have read about already about uh, Southampton, Virginia. None of these succeed. Prosser's Rebellion... Uh, the plan is to burn down the city of Richmond. Doesn't work. Nothing catches on fire because of rain. The leaders are arrested and killed. Denmark Vesey, he was a man who won his freedom in a lottery. That freedom gave him the ability to move around town there in Charleston and plot and plan. Uh, when the rebellion starts there, all the leaders are rounded up and executed. And then Turner's Rebellion... Uh, his group is able to kill some white citizens of South Carolina, but even his rebellion is going to fail about three days after it starts. All right, the next topic I want to talk about real quick has to do with Manifest Destiny and Texas. Once again, I'll try to keep this short. Uh, the first thing you have here are two pictures that represent the idea of Manifest Destiny. Both of these were painted in the 1840s, if I remember correctly. And in both cases, you can see people pointing to the left, which traditionally means west. In the bottom picture, you can see Lady Liberty bringing the light and the Book of Laws to the savages in the west, where it's dark and the people are unenlightened. So Manifest Destiny, easiest way to explain this or make it understandable for you, um, there was this belief that Americans were put on the continent of North America for the express purpose of spreading civilization, spreading ideas, spreading democracy. And I always try to describe this as God said, go west. North America was a gift from God for the the American people to do what they want with. And these ideals of manifest destiny, this spreading of civilization, the spreading of democracy, it's going to be used to um, substantiate race wars against Native Americans. It's going to be used to substantiate a war against Mexico. And manifest destiny, even though it kind of dies down a little bit, it doesn't truly go away until we get into the 1880s, 1890s. Where are the people moving? They're moving to California because gold is discovered. They're moving to the Willamette Valley of Oregon, um, and they're using these very famous trails to do it. The Oregon Trail uh, started in Independence, Missouri, and went to the Willamette Valley of Oregon. Um, over 80,000 people are going to travel on that trail to get to the Pacific Ocean. The California Trail goes from Independence, Missouri to the gold fields of central Colorado, not Colorado, but through Colorado into California. And oh, almost a quarter million people are going to use the California Trail to go and search for gold and settle in California there on the West Coast. There's also the Santa Fe Trail I have down. It's an important trail. Uh, it's not used as much for settlement though. The Santa Fe Trail is used more as a trading route between Mexico and the United States. And it's also used as a route for cattle to be moved to St. Louis so they can be loaded on trains and taken to market on the East Coast. 
The place they're not going is the Great Plains, originally known as the Great American Desert. It was seen as not a good place to live by Europeans because it, it doesn't rain very much in the plains. There's no trees, completely flat, and the ground was extremely hard to, to uh, farm at the time. And because this Great American Desert, aka the Great Plains, was not seen as suitable for the lifestyle of Europeans or European Americans, that's where the indigenous people were moved. So that's why you have a lot of indigenous populations in places such as Kansas, Nebraska, Wyoming, Montana, North and South Dakota, and Oklahoma. Now, conditions in the West were not like you see in a Clint Eastwood movie or like you would see in a John Wayne movie. Interactions between Native Americans and American people moving West, few and far between. Uh, only 5% or so of the deaths could be attributed to interaction between Natives and non-Natives. And... The reason most people died was simply disease or starvation, uh, cholera, scarlet fever, um, accidents where you break your bone and get infections. Uh, there are over 20,000 documented deaths from people trying to move along either the, the uh, California or the Oregon Valley um, trails. The Donner Party is probably the best example of doom. Uh, George Donner, he was an Illinois farmer with a little bit of money and a little bit of fame. He decided that he was going to move his clan out west. Others decided to follow him and pretty much everything that could go wrong on his trek did. They left about a month too late. They didn't bring enough food. The rivers were flooded. People started getting sick. They took a detour. They got lost on the detour, and then when they get to the Sierra Nevada mountains, it starts to snow, they get stuck, and the Donner Party starts to uh, eat other members of the Donner Party. At its largest, I think the Donner Party was about 110 people, but fewer than 50 actually made it to California. The others either died of starvation, illness, or were eaten. There's a video here for you to watch. I'm not going to play it while we're doing this course, but there is a video that you can watch. Um, Texas, I want to be real short on this. Um, American settlers start moving into Texas as early as the 1820s. Texas was part of Mexico. Mexico had just won its independence from Spain. And to try and boost the population of its new northern territories, it invited people to come live there and move in. So American settlers are going to move into Texas in the 1820s, and they're allowed to do this with no questions asked, but there are a couple of stipulations, such as they had to become Catholic, they had to agree to pay in, import taxes for anything brought in from the United States, and they also had to leave their slaves at home. Well, they renamed the slaves to be lifelong indentured servants. They say, sure, we'll convert to Catholicism, but over my dead body, will you pay, make me pay taxes? So tensions between the American settlers and the Mexican authorities just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And by the time we get to 1835, uh, the Alamo is taken over by these American settlers known as um, Texicans. Now, what was the Alamo? Uh, a lot of people don't realize this, but it was a government building it was the provincial capital basically of texas and it was originally a spanish mission a spanish church well by the time we get to 1835 these american settlers are protesting the mexican government they overtake this government building and the Mexican army is going to come in to re-secure their capital city. 
Um, of course, if you're from Texas, there's a completely different point of view, but I'm trying to show you the, uh, the non-Texan side of history. Um, what is true though, is that 200 out of 250 Texicans who had taken over the building uh, were, were killed, only 50 are going to survive. The Texans are going to declare independence from Mexico. A war breaks out. It takes about two months before the Texans are going to force the Spanish to, or not Spanish, but the Mexicans to surrender. And Sam Houston is going to be named the first president of Texas. Now, in reality, they didn't want to remain a an independent country. Their goal all along was to join with the United States. But of course, uh, the United States, they don't want to go to war with Mexico. So they don't let Texas in. And for over 10 years, Texas will remain an independent country until the United States is ready to accept Texas. Finally, 1845, Texas is going to be accepted as a state. The big problem is deciding where the southern border of Texas is. The president in 1845, James K. Polk, is going to send some negotiators to Mexico City, try and negotiate some sort of peaceful exchange. Um, no peaceful exchange really, really happens. And the United States and Mexico go to war with each other in April of 1846. Now, this war, known today as the Mexican-American War, lasts for just about two years. Mexico is forced to surrender when the U.S. Marines show up and, and basically knock on the front door of the Mexican capital in Mexico City. Uh, the result, so... It's the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, which is going to give the United States all the Mexican territories uh, north of the present day border of Spain. Or not Spain, but um, Africa. Ah. The, north, the southern border between Arizona and Mexico. That is what the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo is going to set up. So out of this the United States gets Arizona, New Mexico, Utah, um, Utah, Nevada, California, Texas, officially, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Briefly, immigration. Um, the immigration before the Civil War is significant, but not as significant as it will be later after the war. But I do want to talk about it just for a moment because it changes the makeup of the country. Um, between 1776 and 1815, there's not much immigration. Uh, the War of Re the American Revolution and the Wars of Napoleon kind of put a stop to that. But once Europe calms down, the numbers start to pick up. Between 1825 and 1830, it's about 11,000 to 15,000 immigrants per year. In the 1830s, that's going to go up to right around 25,000 immigrants per year. 1840s, it explodes to about 85,000 per year. But then after that, uh, we get 200,000 almost per year coming into the United States. Then from 1850 to 1860, that is like um, 250,000 per year. So the numbers are going to grow ex exponentially. Where do most of these Europeans come into the country? It's going to be in New York City, but there's no Ellis Island. There's no immigration office. Um, in the 1830s, 1840s, you got on a ship, you sailed across the ocean, you got off the ship in New York, and you just went about your way to wherever you want to go. Um, it's not until 1855 that Castle Garden is set up, which is the first immigration office. And even there, it's not quite as stringent or 
lockdown is today. If you got off a boat, you were asked just three questions, really. Where did you come from? What is your name? Where are you going? And that's all they asked for. The two biggest groups coming over were the Irish and the Germans. The Irish were coming over to the United States as a result of the potato famine. Most of these Irish were poor and could not afford to leave the cities when they moved here. The Germans are going to come here because of political issues. There is a failed revolution in Germany and something like 200 to 250,000 Germans flee their homeland. Now, a lot of the Germans who took part in this political revolution that failed were upper class and middle class. They could afford to move. And so a lot of the Germans settle in the middle part of the country where a lot of the Irish are going to be stuck along the East Coast. You do have some British coming to America. Uh, they're coming mostly to help with uh, industrialization. You have Scandinavians that come to Wisconsin and Minnesota. And then you have Chinese who are going to be brought over mostly as workers, as laborers to build the transcontinental railroad. Last but not least, we have this idea of xenophobia, this fear of, of change, this fear of others. A lot of the people coming over from Europe at the time were Catholic. In fact, um, like 95 to 100 percent of the Irish coming over were Catholic, and about one out of every three of the Germans coming over were Catholic also. So there were real fears that Catholicism was going to take over the United States and that the Pope would become the controller of America. This fear got so bad that a political party was formed in the 1830s that opposed immigration, opposed Catholics, and opposed foreign-born candidates from running for office. And that's known as the Know Nothing Party. Another fear that happened was the idea of Marxism. That guy there with the amazing looking beard, that is Karl Marx. He's going to be the founder of Marxism, modern day socialism, and also the Communist Party is, is part of his platform as well. And some of the things he was pushing for involved better working conditions for the workers and better pay. But on the other side, he thought that businesses should not run and own businesses. So what did the workers actually want? What were what parts of Marxism did they appreciate? Uh, really, it was better pay, better working conditions, and the ability to uh, form labor unions. And that's a part of Mike's, Marxist ideology that really came to America. But a lot of upper and upper middle class Americans thought that Marxist followers were going to overthrow the, uh, the government and overthrow those who had the economic power. All right, I hope this didn't ramble too much, but we're at about the 35 minute mark. And I know your, your attention spans are only so long. If you have any questions or anything, just send me an email. And actually, um, if you want to send me an email, and if you will give me one answer in this email, I, anybody who sends me an email, I will give a five point bonus on your or on your midterm exam. Um, what I want to know, give me in an email one of the reasons in this video that the Donner Party was doomed. So if you watch this video and email me back one of the reasons 
the Donner party was doomed that's found in this video, five extra points on your midterm exam. That will be my thank you for you taking the time to watch this video lecture. So I hope I hear from all of you. I hope all of you watch this and I hope all of you send me an email. Um, but until next week, we'll talk to you later. Have a good one.